So welcome to Uncertain Dots. We're actually on episode, you know what episode we are? It's 13. 13, right. And or, I'm Brett Lane. And you are? I'm Chad Orzel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I so asked you right when after, you put your uh, bottle in your mouth. Yeah, after a couple of weeks hiatus from sick kids and travel and other things. So. It's a busy uh, time of the year, that's for sure. Well, you know, for us, it's not even. We're we're only halfway through. Ah, uh, yeah. So true. You're you're like giving your final or something, right? This is the last week of class. Uh, next week is final exams. Um, I had a student stop by my office the other day, and he wanted to ask about grades and stuff like that. And I'm and I'm like, I, I don't know who you are, because you don't come to class. And I've memorized everyone's name, so <laughs> this is not a That's good thing. A good sign. I have, I, I, think you're one of two people, because there's like a couple people that dropped or didn't, don't come anymore. But I don't really know who you are. So, <laughs> I had a, I had a kid, uh, Jesus, ten years ago now. I had a, a kid who, uh, after the first exam, stopped coming to class, and we do two, two exams in the middle of the term, so. The night we were giving the second exam, I'm coming in and he's sitting on the steps of the science building smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, hey, I wanted to ask you, like, do you think I should drop the class? I'm like, I, I thought you had. Like, I was assuming that you had dropped the class. And that's why and that's you a, weren't coming anymore. That's a trap <laughs> question anyway. I, I will never tell a student whether they should or should not drop a class. Because if you say, oh, no, you shouldn't drop, and then they fail, they're, you, it's your fault. You told me to stay, and I stayed, and I failed. It's your fault. You know? Well, then, then the really bad part is I had to tell them, you know, I think, you know, at this point you probably should drop a class. However, the deadline to drop a class was four days ago. <laughs> so you can't. So well, my advice you to you is come drop. take the exam we're about to give. And you know, so you'll have something other than a zero on it, and and then go to the dean and plead for a dispensation to drop the class. Actually, though, you would probably be better off, if, based on what I've seen, better off if he didn't take the test and ask to withdraw from the class because they almost always ask for retroactive withdrawals. When was the last time they came to class? And uh, so, but I guess that's an administrative thing. Really, the yeah. answer is. The answer is you should keep coming to class and not get behind. This is what I tell my students. I tell my students a whole bunch of stuff at the beginning of the semester, and they never listen. Um, but I say, okay, physics is like a train at Hogwarts, and the train is leaving now, and the train speeds up and it accelerates. So if you wait a couple seconds, you could probably run and catch up. But if you wait two seconds, then it's further away and faster and getting faster, and you're not going to catch up. If you wait too long, yeah. so don't get behind. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've, I've liked about when we since we switched to matter and interactions, the first, you know, the first six weeks of the course used before matter and interactions used to look exactly like a good high school class, and then students you could see students who had had a good high school class would be like, oh, I, you know. I already know this, and you just right. watch their study study habits degrade over over that time. And then about week seven, you know, then we we hit them with something they hadn't seen before. They, you had to do, you know, you had to do some some integrals to do work or something like that. And and then they'd be totally thrown, and and then they would fall apart because they'd gotten and out they of, the catch up. of doing any work, and then. Right, it, it, and every year I could see that happen. And yeah, matter I mean, interactions. It looks weird enough from the beginning that it keeps their attention a little better. Well, that's and good. They stay. It is weird. Engaged. I mean, it is weird compared to a standard high school text. And you know, th this is I think one of the best things about matter and interactions, and and that's that it, it. You know, when you when you take a new book and you look at a new book, almost all the time it's like this is the same book as that book but we have different pictures and we change. This is the one thing that we're going to sell. But it's the same yeah. thing. And I think, I think Matter Interaction said, you know, these are the ideas we want. These are the three main principles, and these are modern ideas, and we're going to use them. 
And I, I really do like that starting all over. It's just it's like uh, it's like a reboot of an operating system or something. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's nice in that respect. I don't know. We're doing the uh, we, we're just up to the start of circuits, which is complicated by the fact that we we lose a day Friday to our annual undergraduate research seminar, or, you know, symposium that we do on campus, and so we. Um, it, we're already a little abbreviated in how we can go through the circuits material and then having to shorten it even more by losing a class right in the middle. But, you know, that's another great point about matter and, and, and interactions. I, the circuits is a great example. You know, when I look at volume two as a whole, for me, especially in matter interactions, it says, what's this book about? It's about the electric and magnetic field. And really, that's what I think is the most important thing in the introductory course of second semester is electric and magnetic field. And so it treats circuits not from this, oh, well, this is voltage and current and resistance, and let's do a whole bunch of cool things, because you can do a whole bunch of cool things. But it says, this is an application of electric and magnetic fields, and let's approach it from that standpoint. Now, and so if you don't spend a lot of time on it, it's not a huge loss, because you're still doing electric and magnetic fields. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the the thing that ends up getting shortchanged is we feel like, because you know, it's a service course largely for the engineering departments, we have to do some something with circuits. And so when we get squeezed for time, what you lose is the, um, you, know, you, you tend to lose some of the microscopic, here's the electric field, here's how this plays out stuff, because, you know, you've got to, to, to satisfy the people in the other departments who depend on the class, we've got to say something about Ohm's law and circuit analysis and equivalent resistance and all of that stuff. So, uh, but I, I, so I think, you know, it's a little tough. I think if if I were, I mean, if if I were designing a electrical engineering program, I mean, I would I would prefer to have my students in the beginning really understand, you know, charge carriers, electric force, electric potential. Um, and not worry about the Wheatstone Bridge or um, things like that as much because that's something that they can add on later. They really understand the fun fundamental things, especially with more modern electronics. It, you really need to know what's going on at the fundamental level for transistors and things like that. So you know it, it is it is yeah. important, and, and and you can't do everything. No, no, you know, you never can, but. And it's actually, I mean, the you know, I'm complaining about losing a class, but it's actually for a good, good cause. I mean, we we do this annual symposium in May where they they cancel classes across campus, and we have a day that's entirely students talking about their undergraduate research projects. So, um, and it's from all different departments. There there'll be like a there's a dance performance that is you know students in the dance program, you know. Showing the the stuff that they that they put together as part of their their senior experiences and and that sort of thing. So that that works out. That's actually a really nice event. We've got you know two physics sessions and one astronomy session going. So we've got you know nine or ten students giving talks about about their research and then another half dozen doing posters. So, so do all the. Um graduating seniors of all the majors do some type of research project? We have a requirement of a, a senior writing experience um, which is somewhat vaguely defined because you know different departments handle it, it differently. Um, we require some kind of research project. Um, some other de in some departments that can be just like not a, a research thing that can be just like a library Project. You know, they, they go and they they do research in the library and then they write a paper uh, about it. You know, it's like just like a long term paper. Um, so, seen some type of senior project. Yeah, we we have some kind of project requirement. The engineering departments all require some kind of project. Um, and is it, is it graded? Some or of the departments with. What's that? Is it graded or they just have to do it? Yeah, it's graded. Yeah, it, it counts as one of their courses. Um, Students are going for departmental honors. Uh, they have to do two terms, at least, and so then it's two courses over the course of the year. And 
the uh, you know some of the departments that have just scads of majors, um, they just don't have enough people to to be able to do original research projects for all of them. So some of them they they shuffle some people who are doing honors do research with faculty and people who are you know just need the course to graduate do library projects and they you know go go read a bunch of books and write a paper about it. So. Well I would think I mean I would think that even for an undergraduate physics major I mean it doesn't necessarily have to be a, I would I wouldn't think it'd have to be an original research you know because even redoing old things especially with new tools is always fun and and very very useful. So. Yeah, you know, we have a, a lot of variability in it, depending on what people are doing. Um, you know, I've had, with uh, experimental things, there's always some piece of something you can build. And, you know, depending on the student, you know, some of them are just, you know, building a box to do a thing, and then you, you know, then you write that up. Uh, some of them operate a little more independently, and they're you know sort of doing an ex an overall experiment that's part of a sequence of things. Um, you know, l lately because I'm um, being chair and all the other stuff I got going on, I haven't been doing so much the really complicated atomic physics stuff. But I've got a couple of side things that I put students on, and I've been having students work on that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I've got a guy now who's a senior who's doing a pretty good job who's doing uh, uh, correlated photon experiments. So we have a you know, BBO crystal and you shine a laser into it and you get out pairs of photons and uh, you can trigger on one of them and then you know that you have a single photon going into some other apparatus and so you can demonstrate, demonstrate that photons exist and demonstrate uh, the dual particle wave stuff and all that kind of thing. So it's not anything groundbreaking. People have been doing this for, you know, 15, 20 years. But um, we don't have that set up here, and he's, you know, putting stuff together and, and doing that. So, that, that so, so it's not original. Nice project. Yeah, I mean, you know, then, then you get into the semantics of what counts as research, right? So, so, but you have leeway. You guys have leeway to say, yeah, you can do that, and, and it's not the same as a, a, a PhD dissertation. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be anywhere near that level. So, um, so you know, it, it's it's nice. Uh, those are a lot of fun to to supervise. Sometimes um, there's also times when it's kind of frustrating. But. Oh yeah, well, real science is frustrating. So, welcome yeah. to the club, right? <laughs> I was like uh, Tiku Majumder at Williams said once that when he gets a new research student, he said the hardest thing to teach them is that this is not a three-hour lab. And so, like you know, if you know, he, he said, get new students in and they'll you know explain, okay, do this, and he said they'll come back at the end, you know, at four o'clock, and like it doesn't work. It's like you know, it's it's not something that has to work within three hours. Like you know, like this could take you the whole summer. To, to do, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take. Go back and keep working. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a great point, right? I mean, we we train these students. Um, well, I think I, I froze up. Are you, you still? Maybe can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we train these students with these three-hour labs, and and it I think it gives them the impression that hey, labs take three hours. Science is is broken up into these little chunks and it works out nicely like that and and they never get the experience that science takes a long time unless they do some type of project. Um, yeah. You know, it's an artificial constraint to say that science happens in a classroom because it doesn't have to. Yeah, you know, we have some, like, the lab for this week, because we're, we're starting circuits, we, you know, we have this, these Kirchhoff's Laws labs to, you know, talk about the node rule and the loop rule and circuit analysis and um, most of the labs we have for it are just terrible. It's like, you know, use the rules to calculate what the, the current should be for this parallel circuit and, you know, and then stick the, the voltmeter in and show that they work. Um, so I tried inverting it today um, and just do, like, look, here's, a, here's, a, here's an ammeter, here's a voltmeter. You know, make a circuit that looks like this and measure all the currents and tell me what you find. And then, 
you know, measure all the voltages and tell me what you find, and then and then sort of go through and say, all right, here are the patterns. Right, this is, you know, in the series circuit, the current's the same through every resistor, and you know, and the voltages are different across the different resistors. Here's the, you know, the parallel circuit, and the voltage is the same, and the currents are different. Well, this, the, there's a point though. The current is the same through all the resistors in series if you measure correctly. <laughs> you know, because you know what they do. They take that ammeter and they hook it across a resistor, and then they boom, <laughs> and it's not the same. So. Yeah, yeah. Now I actually I added that to the list of standards for for standards based grading. Like one That's of the, the circuit of standards is knows how to correct c correctly connect an ammeter and a voltmeter. And, and I will fight to, to have a question on the exam that is, you know, here is a circuit. Draw in the ammeter that you would use to, uh, to to do this, and draw in where you would put the voltmeter to to do this, because I think that's um, even with even with starting the class with this is how you connect this one, this is how you oh. connect that one, and matter. going through and and checking. That they were connecting things properly on the first circuit, we still blew three fuses in uh, in the, the ammeters. Like the you know the fluke meters we have 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 fuses on on them, and if you plug it in parallel with the power supply, that fuse goes like that. And yeah, we, we killed three of them, of course, in the lab. And well, a fuse is better than that other thing. What's that funny smell? <laughs> Who plugged in something wrong? How do you know that someone plugged in something wrong, Dr. Lane? I can smell it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we have these big these big electrolytic capacitors that we use for uh, another lab. I had uh, students wire one of those up backwards. Um, yeah, yeah, about you know, eight years ago, two students wired it up backwards and then left it connected to the power supply for, for like ten minutes. And there's, there's a little plug at the top of it that eventually pops out and then it sprays hot uh, dielectric <laughs> fluid all over everything. Like wow. Well, these didn't explode. So, so yeah, at least... That's the it, one thing it, that... But, I mean, it's this sticky, viscous, nasty oil like that oil. was all yeah. over one of the tables for a couple of weeks. I mean, but that is the nice thing about physics. You know, we're, we have chemistry and physics. Man, the chemists... You know, they can't set up, they can't do their own lab. They have to have the same thing to set up the chemicals. You have students get hurt in lab. You have to wear eyewear. You can't wear shorts, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we only have a couple labs where you have to wear it's anything with safety, you know. And, and even then, it's like, don't drop this on your toe. So. Yeah, I do. I, I have had students in, in a lab asking, you know, can we wear open toed shoes? I'm like, what the hell do I care what you wear on your feet? <laughs> you know. Well, it's better to ask. A couple labs where there's like radioactive sources in there. They have like lead bricks, or or we do the karate board breaking thing where they have cinder blocks. And I was gonna, the safety lecture is bricks are heavy. Like, you know, keep your hands and feet clear of the bottom of the platform, and you'll be okay. <laughs> um, you know, we have uh, when students come to lab in the chemistry lab, if they don't have the right shoes, we have this like box of old shoes, like. Here's some shoes. <laughs> you don't want to put those on. <laughs> it's like a bowling alley. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, except they they don't spray these probably. I don't know. So we've also we do a Compton effect lab where you know we have a, a moderately hot source, um, but you know you build a little house of lead bricks and you have the source inside it and there's a opening so you know you get a beam of of uh, gamma rays coming out and then you're going to scatter them off whatever. Um, and when it's not, when you're not actively taking data, you put a brick in front of the the hole that covers it. And the the safety officers that, that we used to have would insist on being there for the start of the lab. He would have his Geiger counter on the highest set, on the most sensitive setting, so it just screamed the whole time. Um, and, and and then he would insist that you had to try and maneuver the the brick back in front of the opening with a stick from you know, from some distance away, which, you know, takes three times as long as, like, just grab the brick and set it in front of the door. And, you know, you do that, it takes two seconds, you're out of the way, you know, and, and just just stop. Okay. 
You know, though, I mean, people do really freak out about radiation. You know, I, I, I guess it's from the, the 60s or whatever when they, they did, you know, started dealing with nuclear bombs and stuff. But, I mean, you just say radioactive. Ah! Danger! You know? Yeah. He also routinely would lose track of, you know, we have a drawer where we keep the radioactive sources. And he would have to go down there and inventory them periodically and, and would not find them. And I was like, you know, where where's the cobalt sixty source? Like, it's in the drawer. It's like, well, I I looked in the drawer, I didn't see it there. Why don't you get the Geiger counter out? You can find it's it. right on top of the pile. Like, get the Geiger it's, counter. It's right there. So. Or use your James Bond Geiger counter watch, right? <laughs> oh. But we do Wait, have. We, I mean, I, we found I, a mystery I, source this past summer. Like, oh. like a, a source turned up that was radioactive. None of us have any idea what it is. So. Was it kryptonite? <laughs> Could have been. I don't know. None, um, none of we, us are from planets with red suns. so. We do have... Uh, I mean, I do get concerned in the circuits labs. Um, you, you know, you're not... Especially when you do things like, um, I don't know, we're going to run, you know, five amps through this wire and heat it up and, and you know get this water hot and measure the change in temperature, you know, I'm always, I let me check your thing before you turn that on, because. Yeah, yeah we're going to, you know, probably, you it, it up, won't be bad, but. And, and then I'm going to, I'm going to look at it before you turn the power on. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was today. I did a bunch of that. So. But it's still not as bad as chemistry. No. They, they have, you know, acids and stuff that gets hot and burning stuff and everything. It's, yeah. Would not want to be there. Yeah, and we get these, you know, questions every so often about, you know, what safety training do you need for your students? Like, we really don't. Like, you know, most of what they do, they're like, mm -hmm. they're like throwing a ball in the air and, and you know, watching it come back down. It's not, it's not that hard. So, Paper so, cuts. Yes. So they, they and might... um, ergonomics for for numerical calculations. To make sure you you don't lean over too much when you're typing. Yeah, they gotta, you know, keep your shoulders back while you're typing. So but, I don't know. And of course, I'm behind from traveling last week, so that's <coughs> that that complicates everything too. That's true. But you had a good trip. Yeah, you know, the travel was, was more miserable than usual, but but it was interesting. So it was Space you went Center to the Houston. Houston Space Center? Yeah. Big rockets. Big rockets yeah. are cool. Yeah, that's that's true. And they had a they had a new opening of something or they just had uh, had you down to give a talk? They had me down to give talks for their they had a physics day, so they had like school groups come in. Um, you know, the, the second day they had a parking lot full of buses, but very few of them came to my talk. Um, and they uh, um, they had me, and they had uh, Brian Mallow, who does the science yeah. comedian. Um, so they had him there to do science themed stand up, um, which I've seen his, his seen him a couple of times. That's that's always enjoyable. Yeah, so, uh, it's always have to, fun to have entertainment with some science in there too. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't think that a lot, it's not really that people learn a lot like from that, but it's fun and it shows that there's cool stuff in science, you know, that's that's what I would say from it. And it's, I, I, it's still a form of entertainment for me, so. Yeah, yeah, he had it, he had it a little rough. He had one group, one of the performances, one group got up and left halfway through his act because they were a school group and they had to they had to leave. They had to, oh. they had to get on a bus to get back to their school. So they were very apologetic. And then a few minutes after that a second group of people walked out and he was like like and <laughs> afterwards was talking to the staff members who uh, bumped into those people on their way out and said they did, they didn't actually speak English. That they oh. were they were Spanish speakers and so didn't understand a word of your act. So they were they were just very confused about what was going on. So, I, say, yeah, I mean, I would be concerned if a whole bunch of people got up and left from a talk too. But I mean, I'd, I'd keep going. I wouldn't be offended. I'd just I'd just you know think I did something wrong. So yeah. 
I had the, the very first talk I ever gave at a conference, I had uh, I was talking about collisions between xenon atoms, and I was in a session with a whole bunch of people who were talking about collisions between alkali metals, and it, the sort of collisions they were talking about are important if, for eff efforts to make Bose-Einstein condensation, and this was you know several months before they they first got BEC. So everybody started their 10-minute talk with, you know, we're studying these collisions between alkali atoms so as to be able to predict the properties of Bose-Einstein condensation. So I got up to talk about xenon and started my talk by saying, um, this is going to be something completely different. What I'm going to tell you has absolutely no applicability to Bose-Einstein condensation. And Carl Wyman, who um, got the Nobel for BEC, stood up and walked out. <laughs> Well, but I mean, people walk in and out of con those conference talks all the time because it's so short, and you got to meet another one, and right. Yeah. But so. this was this this was just perfect. You know, like I said that, and he got up and 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 left, and it, and it was great. It this? ended up being good because I was I was sufficiently annoyed by that that it got me past the stage fright because it was I I'm like a second year grad student. It was my first talk at a conference ever. And then this this guy stands up and walks out on me. Hmm. A Nobel Prize winner walks out on you. Well, he didn't have the Nobel yet, not for oh, another well. six years. So, but my my first conference talk, um, this was this was like nine years after I graduated from high school. Okay, I'm giving mm -hmm. a talk. I'm looking at the speaker list to see which order I am. The person giving the talk before me is my high school physics teacher, who I hadn't seen in nine years because I was in you know, three different states from then. I'm like, <laughs> that was my high school physics teacher, and uh, and he remembered me, so it was kind of it was weird, but it was cool. That's pretty good. Yeah. And we had so the the weirdest one I'm talking about moving between things and skip. I went to uh, NCUR, the National Conference on Undergraduate Research. We take students there. I was one of the faculty chaperones one year. For that, they had a different. They 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 gave out printed programs that listed what talks were in what session, and they had the speakers in some order. And if you went to the room where the talks were going, they had a sign outside the door that listed the speakers in a different order. So there was no way to predict, like like some of the session chairs were going off the printed program, some of them were going off the signs that were at the rooms. You couldn't predict what what order the talks were going to be in. And they have, they have like 15 parallel sessions going on. I'm there with, you know, 30 kids from Union. And I'm trying to, you know, to be moral support and show up to as many of their talks as I can. And it, it's like, there's no way to tell. Like, yeah. And, and they said they did it deliberately so that people wouldn't move between sessions. I'm like, oh, come I'm on. here with, with a big group. Like, I'm if supposed to see as many of them as I can. If you don't want people to switch between sessions and only have one session at a time, yeah, yeah, you can't you can't have parallel sessions and not have people move between them. But but, but this is why I do not want to be in charge of organizing a conference. <laughs> no, no, that sounds sounds miserable. Um, yeah. Because it's also I mean it, it's it's another of those no win things. I mean, if it you know, if it goes well, people will be like, oh, that was a good meeting, you know, and then they'll just leave. If it, but if it goes badly, you are the worst person on earth for, you know, for that week. According. And you can't get everything right. There's no way. I mean, there's no way. No, Unless always, you have the same conference in the same place every year, and this is the 10th year, then you pretty much got it down. But other than that, you just, there's too many variables that you can't control. Yeah, and even that, you know, some like the the caterer won't show up with the food, or you know, or or you'll run out of coffee or something, and, and you know. And that's your fault. Yeah, and it's your fault, even though it's like it's the same person we hired last year. I don't know why they screwed it up. So, yeah. So, uh, well, we yeah. well we made another uh, we've made it to another thirty minute uh, hangout. I know we don't really have a time limit, but. I think it's as yeah, always. I think that's that's that, that's good good for this week. I think. And, uh, yeah, I, I I wonder if there is a maximum. I mean, an optimal time length that would that would encourage people to watch. I don't know. I don't know. You know, there seem to be a lot of half hour to an hour um, 
podcasts and and hangouts and things like that. It seems fairly yeah, typical. and we get we get about you know sixty to it's, most of the videos have about sixty to seventy views. So I think it's somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, so. it's probably about you know the people people reading the blog. Uh, fairly good day. Fairly good day. It's like a couple hundred uh, views for for a new post, and uh, and a smallish fraction of those will actually click on any video that's embedded. Um, it's really kind of amazing because if you put stuff up that has video in it, it, it gets more hits, but somehow people don't actually watch the video. Which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? No, no, I've no. I, I think that. Good. No, I think YouTube counts it different if it's an embedded click versus a YouTube click. So if they maybe click I, that YouTube button in the embedded video, it takes it to YouTube. That's that's why. Maybe that's maybe I'm that's what's sure. going on. But yeah, um, and some some of them take a while to show up because I had the those two videos I did last week with um, with Steely Kid on you know the Coriolis thing on the merry-go-round and the and pushing her on a on a table throwing a ball up in the air to do Galilean relativity. Uh, both days, I you know I posted those and I'm like you know people should watch this because it's you know it's pretty cool and because kids and it, and like you know at the end of the day it, like 10 p.m. it's showing like like 15 hits you know 15 mm -hmm. views but like the next day it was a couple hundred and so so I think it's I think there's some lag in counting some of the the things that YouTube does. I mean, I, I know we should end, but I do have to say that, you know, I'm glad that more people like like you and are doing what I do, which is, you know, use your kids in the science videos. I think in, in the past it was kind of like, oh, you can't put kids in a video, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I said, you know, why not? And so I put them in there, and then uh, Smarter Every Day, you know, Dustin from Smarter Every Day, he's yeah. starting to use his kids now too, so now I'm like, okay. It's Good. some of it is getting the getting the kids at the right age where they wanted to help That's, out. I was really kid, I say, yeah, we're gonna go make some science videos. He was like, Yay, science! Like, okay, right. so I made I made some videos for my book, Angry Birds: Furious Forces, um, okay. and uh, you know, one I made like four. And you know, I, I have kids, right? I have multiple kids, and so I said, I said, I'll use different kids for different videos. They all ended up having the same kid in them because that one kid was way better <laughs> than all, and making videos and all the other ones. So, yeah, oh, wow. she was she she lost interest uh, after you know we did multiple takes of a couple of things and that that wasn't going over so well. You know, she yeah. she wanted like okay we did that then we're done you know um, but but on the on the other multiple hand multiple takes doesn't know, go over well with me either so <laughs> the uh, the. The payment for it was, you know, the 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 full talent budget was spent on, you know, five dollars worth of frozen yogurt, <laughs> and she was over the moon. So, yeah. so you know, hey, it works. So. Okay, hey, before we go, I just want to you know, the few people that you know that do watch this, um, you have a question they want us to answer. You know, no one ever sends us questions, but I I think we'd probably be more than happy to answer questions if they were, you know, if they were unreasonable questions, we'd probably just say what they are and why we don't want to answer them, but um, yeah. if we get flooded with questions, then maybe that'd be different, but so send it on Twitter, I think is the best way to send it to either Chad or myself, and then yeah, I think, we'll I, I think that, and we, we're, we're kind of bad about, uh, since we, we only usually decide to do this about two hours in advance, um, we we should probably be better about soliciting questions on Twitter, because the couple yeah. of times that we did that with substantial advance notice, we actually got some. So it's the uh, thirty minutes before. Oh, by the way, does anyone have any questions? That doesn't right. work so well. So this is a week before now. So a week yep. before the next episode, send us your questions. We will answer your questions. It can be. I, I will be happy to answer anything. It's. I love answering questions. So. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, science stuff even. <laughs> no. You can ask me whatever. I don't really your, care. Your, the answers will be more reliable if they have something to do with physics. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right. So we'll see you guys next week then. All right. Sounds good. Till next week. All right.